Good news is I found another really beautiful integration result. And the focus of today's video is this integral that I'm going to be calling I. And to evaluate it and get that beautiful integration result, I'm going to define an integral function I of some parameter S as the integral from zero to infinity of sine x dx divided by x to the s. The motivation for defining this integral function comes not directly from the integral we're going to be evaluating today, but in fact I was just messing around with a previous integral, uh, a previous integration result that involved this integral or a very, very similar integral as a starting point. So yeah, that's a very nice approach to have in mathematics in general, that you can mess around with previously derived results and derive even more or explore even more satisfying and beautiful uh, results in mathematics or derivations in mathematics. So yeah, it's extremely fun to play around with previously derived knowledge. Now, how exactly is this integral function related to our target integral? Well, if you differentiate with respect to the parameter s, and the golden question here is, of course, can we perform the switch up of the integration and the differentiation operators? Well, the good news is for s being greater than or equal to 1, this integrand gives you a convergent integral. So we can indeed perform the switch up and we have the integral from zero to infinity. And because of the switch up, the total derivative becomes a partial one. So we have the partial derivative with respect to s of sine x divided by x to the s dx. And performing this partial differentiation, we have this constant term of sine x constant in the s world that is divided by x to the s. Now, if you differentiate partially with respect to s, x to the negative s, then you get x to the negative s times the natural logarithm of your constant base x. And because of the chain rule, you have an extra negative sign. So we have this negative sign outside and we have the natural log of x dx. So that means your target integral is in fact the negative of the derivative of the integral function evaluated at s equals to 1. Okay, so just a quick recap. This is our target integral. This is our integral function. And this is how the integral function and the target integral are related through a first derivative. Okay, so let's take, take a study of our integral function. We have i of s defined as the integral from zero to infinity of sine x by x to the s dx. And how I'm gonna proceed from here is one of my favorite integration techniques it involves a parameterization using the gamma function. And I think it was subscriber viol integral that once, uh, he once pointed out that this is something called the Schwinger parameterization or something like that. I'm not sure if I remember correctly. So anyway, um, what it hinges on, it hinges on finding an integral representation of 1 by x to the s, which is quite useful, and I've, and I've uh, utilized this integral representation in previous videos, for example, on the uh, generalized Dirichlet and the Fresnel integrals. Link in the description below if you want to see that as well. They're pretty awesome videos. And, of course, the one time I took on Ramanujan in an integral death battle that I've won because Ramanujan is dead, so that implies that I've won the death battle. Anyway, so uh, we need an integral i sub 1, and this is defined as the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the s minus 1 times e to the negative t, which you recognize as the gamma function, but we introduce a parameter x in this case. So we need a substitution. We let t times x equal to u, which implies that dt equals 1 by x du, and the limits of integration are not bothered whatsoever. So we have i sub 1 being equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of u to the s minus 1 divided by x to the s minus 1 times e to the negative u du by x. And you can factor out the x's, you can... Uh, take the x's out of the integration operator, that is, because the x terms here are constants in the u world. So we have 1 by multiplying these two terms will give you an x to the s term outside, 
and we have the integral from 0 to infinity of u to the s minus 1 times e to the negative u du, which we recognize as the gamma function evaluated at s. Okay, cool. Oh, sorry about that. Terribly sorry. So we have gamma s here being equal to this integral i sub 1. So this implies that 1 by x to the s equals the reciprocal of the gamma function evaluated at s times this integral i sub 1, which is the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the s minus 1 times e to the negative tx dt. Now that we have our integral representation, we can plug this into our integral function i of s, and we now have the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x times the reciprocal of the gamma function at s times the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the s minus 1 times e to the negative tx, integration with respect to t, and we're integrating all of this with respect to x. And because sine x is independent of the t variable, we can slip it inside this integration with respect to t. And this uh, gamma term here is just a constant that we, that we can take out of the integral. So we now have the double integral from 0 to infinity of sine x times t to the s minus 1 times e to the negative tx. Integration first with respect to t and then with respect to x. And now for the second golden question of the day. Can we switch up the order of the integration operators? Now I'm really enjoying this uh, solution development because it combines two of my favorite techniques. One is Feynman's trick of differentiating under the integral sign and the second is this parameterization using the gamma function. So I'm having a wonderful time evaluating this integral and I hope you're enjoying it too. So it would be a good time to hit the like button and subscribe as well. Anyway, so can we perform the switch up? Well, we're, we're going to need to do some investigation regarding the integrand. So we have sine x, which is a bounded function anyway, no problem whatsoever. We have this damping factor e to the negative tx. So yeah, nothing wrong here either. And we have t to the s minus 1. And the parameter s is in our control. So yeah, we're not going to let it, uh, we're not going to let this term bother convergence and boundedness. So, okay, cool. So we have no problems regarding convergence or boundedness. And this entire integrand is a continuous function of both x and t. So using Fubini's theorem, we can in fact perform the switch up. So we have 1 by gamma s times the double integral from 0 to infinity integration first being carried out with respect to x and then with respect to t of sine x times t to the s minus 1 times e to the negative tx. Now first up notice that we're integrating first with respect to x and this t to the s minus 1 term is independent of x so we can take it outside the uh, integration, the first integral that is. So we have 1 by gamma s times the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the s minus 1 times the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x times e to the negative tx dx. And we have this outer integration with respect to t. And now this integration with respect to x is quite easy. You can use basic complex analysis using Euler's formula. Or you could use integration by parts twice. And this will evaluate to... 1 by 1 plus t squared. So you have in the numerator, because of this uh, t to the s minus 1 term being multiplied, t to the s minus 1 divided by 1 plus t squared. And we're integrating this from 0 to infinity. And outside, do not forget this 1 by gamma s term. All we need is one more substitution and we're home free. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this t squared term and let it equal to y, which implies that dt equals 1 half times y to the negative 1 half dy. Okay, cool. So this implies that i of s equals 1 by gamma s times the integral from, again, 0 to infinity because the limits of integration are not bothered by this transformation of y to the s minus 1 by 2. And the differential element here will give you a factor of y to the negative 1 half and a factor of 1 by 2 as well. So let's just take this out. dy, all of this divided by 1 plus y. 
and multiplying out the terms in the numerator, you get s minus 2 by 2, which, which you can write quite nicely as s by 2 minus 1. And what you're left with now is an integral representation of Euler's wonderful reflection formula. So the thing is, the integral from 0 to infinity of y to the z minus 1 divided by 1 plus y dy equals gamma z times gamma 1 minus z, which equals pi times the cosecant, the cosecant of pi times z, and that is a horrible z. Once again, I'm terribly sorry for that. My handwriting is never going to get any better. Okay, so this implies that i of s equals uh, 1 by 2 gamma s times pi times the cosecant. Now, what exactly is z here? Well, just comparing the exponents, that lets you know that z equals s by 2. So we have the cosecant of pi times s by 2. Now it's time to recall what we're interested in. Our target integral equals the negative of the derivative of i of s evaluated at s equals 1. So now we have to differentiate our integral function i of s. So differentiating with respect to s gives you um, this factor of pi by 2. And using the product rule, the quotient rule, use any one you want, we should get a negative uh, gamma prime s divided by the square of the gamma function times this cosecant function, uh, pi s by 2. Again, I'm terribly sorry. Minus uh, gamma or the reciprocal of gamma s, and you're differentiating this cosecant, right? So again, you're going to get, because of the chain rule, another, another pi by 2, um, cosecant pi s by 2, and I'm running out of space. So I'm just going to perform some trickery here. So we have, just writing it a bit more clearly, cosecant pi s by 2 times the cotangent of pi s by 2. And all of this needs to be divided or multiplied by the reciprocal of gamma s. Okay, nice. And now all we have to do is plug in s equals 1. So this implies that i uh, prime at 1 equals pi by 2 times the derivative of the gamma function of 1 divided by now gamma 1 equals 1. 0 factorial is 1, right? So we'll just get rid of the denominator term. And we have the cosecant of pi by 2 minus pi by 2. Again, gamma 1 is 1. And we have cosecant pi by 2 times cotangent pi by 2. And now cotangent pi by 2 is a 0, so that means the entire term here is 0. And this implies that the derivative of i uh, at 1 equals pi by 2 times, again, the cosecant, sorry, I forgot the c over there. So the cosecant of pi by 2 is just 1 again. So we have pi by 2 times a missing negative sign. Thankfully, I caught it right on time of the, uh, we have pi by 2 times the derivative of the gamma function evaluated at s equals 1. And this derivative here equals a very special constant. It's the negative of the Euler Mascheroni constant. So that means on the right hand side, we have pi times little gamma divided by 2. So this implies that the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x times log x divided by x dx, which is the negative of this value right here, equals a very elegant result indeed. It's negative gamma pi by 2. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.